fans and here we are at the uh, at the foot of Brushy Mountain, which is just an absolute uh, beautiful vista. And uh, Governor, in case uh, you didn't know, there was a lot of time that was spent in finding exactly uh, the best view of the mountain, and this was chosen. Uh, and what a beautiful day, uh, what a beautiful event, and what a beautiful commitment by uh, Cinda Jones and certainly uh, the Cowles family uh, and everybody who worked so hard uh, protecting the view and the working for us here um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we are here um, to celebrate. And thank you all for being here today. Um, and we are going to move this right along uh, because there's a great lunch that uh, Cinda has provided. Um, but it is my great honor um, at this time uh, to introduce uh, the man that has had a vision since the time he um, took office as governor. Um, at a time um, when the economies were not, were not very good across this country, most governors backed away from their commitments to land conservation, land protection, uh, and the advancement of open space, recreational opportunities, and the working lands um, of their state. But Governor Patrick and Lieutenant Governor Murray, in fact, doubled down on their investments because they knew the importance that these lands um, had for future generations. And you will hear Governor Patrick talk often about our responsibility as a government not to govern for the next quarter, but for the next generation. And nothing speaks louder to that commitment and that vision of Governor Patrick and Lieutenant Governor Murray than this, um, this uh, project here today and the fact that we are preserving some almost 3,500 acres here in the Commonwealth um, of Massachusetts. And at a time when other states were moving away and we did double down, we have seen more land go into protection than has been developed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have seen a bigger commitment to the working lands of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts than ever in the history of our Commonwealth. We've seen investments in parks, some 153 since the time the governor and lieutenant governor took office. And that commitment is made because there is a clear and deep understanding of how important our open spaces are, our recreational opportunities are, our working forests are, what those mean to the economic development of the regions where they're in, and what they ultimately mean to the quality of life of the residents of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. No one has ever made a bigger commitment to the open space and lands in this Commonwealth than the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it's my great honor to introduce our governor, Governor Deval Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to the secretary for the kind, very kind introduction and basically for giving my remarks so I can keep this <laughs> even, uh, even shorter. I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your service and all of the members of the team from Energy and Environmental Affairs who were here. I want to acknowledge Cinda and her whole family for the generosity of this partnership. Uh, the members of the legislature who were, who were here, uh, the congressman who is here, and all of our neighbors. Um, we are here because of these young people who sang so beautifully today. Because of Sam, because of Miles and Spencer, young man I met just a minute ago. Because we have to begin to bring not just into our government but into our lives this notion that each of us in our time is supposed to do what we can to leave things better for those who come before us and those who come behind us. That we have to be about leaving, about bearing our generational responsibility. And I can tell you it sometimes surprises people as a city kid that I get that open space and working farms and forests are a part of our generational responsibility. But I do. I do. My grandmother, with whom I grew up, had a little patch out behind the tenement on the south side of Chicago that she worked. And she, brew, she grew uh, roses, mainly. One climber, a cutting that she brought back from my great-grandparents' place in Kentucky. She trained up the side of that tenement. It grew, near, grew nearly two stories up the side of that tenement. And it was an improbable thing especially in that place and in that soil. But she tended her garden. 
She understood that fundamental idea that if we want to bring something beautiful and important and lasting forth, then we have to tend our garden in our time. That's why we're here. I want to begin by recognizing the commitment of Cinda Jones and the entire Coles family for your dedication to preserving this forest. From what I've heard, Paul was a man of great passion, commitment, strength, energy, who loved his family, his community, and this commonwealth. We name this forest after Paul as a way to allow his legacy to live on forever in the forest he so dearly loved and to remind us again of our own responsibilities. At nearly 3,500 acres, fully 5.4 square miles, this is the largest conservation restriction acquisition on a continuous block of privately owned land in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is part of the hundreds of acquisitions accomplished by our administration and our land trust and community partners that have conserved over 97,000 acres so far, an 8% increase in our open protected space in only five years. And understand, again, an example of how we can reject false choices. Because while we have been preserving that land, while we have invested, in undeveloped and open spaces and working forests and farms. We have moved from 47th in job creation to near the top in the country. We can do this all and do it all together. We are grateful for the tremendous amount of collaboration that went into conserving and dedicating this forest. We thank the Obama administration and the US Forest Service for $5 million in funding from the Forest Legacy Program, the largest forest legacy grant ever awarded here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We thank you as well to the Open Space Institute, the Kohlberg Foundation, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation for your generous financial support, the partnership between the Department of Fish and Game, W.D. Coles, the Kestrel Land Trust, and the Franklin Land Trust were also vital to the success of this complex land conservation initiative. The protection of this forest ensures conservation of our natural beauty for this generation and the next. It does reflect our generational responsibility. And I hope that for generations to come, this preservation will remind us of the responsibility each of us have in our own life and our own times to do and live by this example. Thank you so much for having me today. My the governor talked about the many partners that uh, made this possible today, and certainly uh, we could not have done this without the U.S. Forest Service. And we are privileged and honored uh, to have the chief um, here today, Tom Tidwell. And I had the opportunity to drive in from, uh, from Hadley with Tom and uh, talk about the importance of uh, working lands uh, to the economy in the region uh, that they are in. So central and western Massachusetts um, does have an economy um, around our working force, and it is important uh, to talk about that and to support that. And Tom has done great work in this area, and it's my pr privilege to bring forward the U.S. Forest Service Chief, Tom Tidwell. Mr. Secretary, well, thank you for the introduction. Governor, thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone that's been part of this. It's a real privilege to um, get to be here today to, um, to represent uh, the U.S. Forest Service and to be part of what we're talking about today. Governor, when you um, are known to be um, not only to govern for today, but to govern for the next generation, I just want to applaud that. I think that's the sort of leadership that, uh, for me, is so important. Because for the mission of the Forest Service, it's not just about this generation. It's always been about doing what we can to ensure that the next generation has the same opportunities, the same choices, to be able to enjoy the conservation legacy that we're so fortunate to have in this country. And today, we're talking about adding to that legacy. It's great that um, our program, the, the Forest Legacy Program, has been set up to be able to provide funding, funding for partnerships, to be able to work with willing landowners, to really make those 
sometimes difficult but so important decisions to set aside lands so that the future generation is going to have the same benefits that we've been able to enjoy. I just cannot thank all of you enough you know, for, that, for that leadership. There's no question the benefits that these landscapes provide. It helps us to deal with the invasives. It helps provide that essential wildlife habitat. It provides the clean water that we all rely on every day. And these forested landscapes also clean our air for us every day. In addition to that is the recreational opportunities and also the, all the economic activity that comes along with that. For, for us to be able to maintain these forested landscapes, we need to continue to manage that. And so today, that this is titled the Policy Jones Working Forest. And it's working in a way to continue to provide all those benefits I just mentioned. But it will also provide economic activity because it will take management for us to be able to maintain and restore these forests, to be able to maintain the benefits that they produce these lands will continue to be managed. And so it's not just the jobs that are produced from the restoration work that will need to occur from time to time to be able to maintain the forest health, but the, rec the economic activities from the recreation that will come from this. The economic activities that will just come from tourism, from people wanting to come here to be able to enjoy this. And not to mention the benefits it provides for everyone that gets to live in this incredible place just your quality of life. I cannot thank the family enough. You know, Cinda, it's nice to you know, see you again um, for the Jones family, for the uh, Coles family, but not only for what you're doing, but also for Sam and the rest of the kids at your, your age. That's what this is really about today. And I tell you, I am I'm pleased to be here. And not only is this the largest uh, land acquisition, but folks need to understand that the Commonwealth is the leader in our forest legacy program with the number of, of parcels that they've worked with. And I, am, I feel great to know that we have another one lined up for next year too. And I'll tell you, it's, this is the type of leadership that really makes a difference. And, I, and it's already been mentioned, and I won't try to, to um, duplicate, replicate all the names of all the partners. But it takes a lot of people working really hard to be able to pull these together. And because of that, our future generation is going to get to enjoy these benefits again. So thank you again for letting us be part of this today. It's just that I have a lot of pride uh, to be able to be up here representing our folks that work so hard on this in partnership with you. But thank you so much. Governor, thank you again for your leadership, for your vision. Uh, I tell you, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Sam, I think you may be the most famous person at the end of this, uh, at the end of this event. Um, we could not do this with, uh, without our uh, support from our elected officials, and we have uh, many of them here today. And I have to say that uh, the state delegation is one that has always been steadfast, uh, not only for land preservation, but all issues um, of the environment. Um, they are always there, um, always willing to help. Uh, and certainly this project was no exception. So I'd like to recognize and thank Senator Stan Rosenberg um, that is here. Rep Representative Steve Kulik. Representative Ellen Story. And I and a close friend of the Jones and uh, Coles family, Representative Dan Winslow. Um, we've already heard, obviously, from the U.S. Forest Service, but we've also had one loud voice um, in Washington um, at all times on all projects of open space, trails. Um, it is not uncommon to get the 1130 in the night call um, from Congressman Olver asking about some jog of a, a boundary line. Um, so you never know when those are calls are coming. But uh, there is nobody more engaged, and certainly nobody more engaged in the minutia of all these projects that make these happen um, than our Congressman, Congressman John Olver. And John. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. We've had a long working relationship, and I can think of nothing better than uh, than moving toward the end of my time in 
the Congress with this one before us here, here today. I see, as I look around, virtually everybody who's anybody in the environmental protection field here in the, uh, the uh, Pioneer Valley is here, and some from beyond that direction, as well we should be here. Uh, this is a jewel in the crown of our environmental protection in this area. And um, as Tom Tidwell has already said, it is a partnership issue. The federal money, which is the largest piece of this money, as already has been indicated, uh, is there and it requires having states who are partners, private owners who are partners, and the, and the intermediaries, the brokers in between, the land trusts and such. In this case, it was uh, the Kestrel Trust and, uh, and the Franklin Land Trust who have, as, as said, have, have had the largest role in that brokerage. And, um, and, but it requires, at this, uh, uh, the Forest Legacy Program is our program to try to keep working forests going in places that might otherwise slip away. And as Tom has said, that's what we are about, cre creating those forests that can, can last long into the future. We have a governor, and Governor uh, Patrick, uh, I, uh, I applaud you and thank you for the commitment that you've made to this uh, pro program uh, over time. Massachusetts, as I think Tom mentioned, has been very effective in using the Forest Legacy Program, and he's already basically promised us uh, something for next year, <laughs> which uh, some of you in this uh, uh, area know exactly what that is. But you and uh, you, uh, Mr. Governor, and the, uh, uh, and the people that you have, have named, Rick Sullivan is the secretary, the former commissioner, and the present commissioner, Ed Lambert, um, they have been true leaders in putting together the partnerships and taking the state's part, and part in this forward along the way. But nothing happens unless you've got the private partner and that, of course, is the W.D. Coles uh, operation, the Coles family, and Cinda Jones, who is the personification these days of the W.D. Coles <laughs> operation. So, Cinda, congratulations on your role in this, in putting this together. It has taken some time, uh, as you know. It's been several years. It was in the process, and we had to scramble around a little bit to find all the money. So. My congratulations, and, uh, and thank you very much, all of you who have been those partners in this process in making this go forward. We'll have other ones in, uh, in the next year or so. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, it is time now to uh, have the most personal words um, spoken, the person that has spent the most times on these properties, the person that has, with her family, uh, worked these lands uh, for so long, um, who has been dedicated uh, to the preservation um, of those lands and of the fact that they are working lands and working force, um, the importance of that um, to, the, to the regional economy here um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, and her willingness um, to step up and make that vision become a reality so that future generations um, can have those same experiences and that same quality of life. Um, and with a first a thank you to, but then an introduction of Cinda Jones, president of W.D. Cole's Land Company. Thank you. I keep on being called out singularly, and this is a big family and a lot of people making this decision. I'm just a figurehead, so thank you. Thank you for celebrating with us today. We're proud of this conservation achievement. I think it's the best thing that we've ever done. Uh, I wanna make two quick points, and then I would like to thank the people who made this possible. My dad's legacy, conservation at this amazing scale, it's the entire mountain range you see behind you, was made possible by our family for hundreds of years managing economically viable working forests. And more shocking than our cutting trees, the conservation of the mountain range was also made possible because we developed elsewhere. Dad taught me and Evan 
there's a critical balance between conservation and development, and one enables the other. This parcel started with just a few acres in the mid-1860s, and our family um, had some economic success with forestry and were able to add to the acres, generated enough revenue to acquire thousands of more acres, and these are being conserved today. So the active forest management caused the conservation to happen. When my dad would sell a one acre house lot, frontage lot on our timberland, some neighbors would get upset about development. But he would use the proceeds to either pay the taxes on that open space or he would uh, buy 100 acres of timberland with the revenue. Then again, development helped conservation. When my dad built Riverside Park Apartments in North Amherst and then a dozen subdivisions with um, clustered smart growth. Again, <laughs> families didn't build in rural areas. A&R lots, cluster subdivisions, and building in existing village centers <laughs> enable this kind of conservation. You can't have one without the other. We did a good job negotiating this conservation restriction. It allows reasonable economic potential and I think we made some inroads for future conservation restrictions to make sure that family farms are more viable going forward. But I think Massachusetts could do even better if we could allow alternative energy on CRs and APRs, we'd be better off because then the family farms would have additional income and potential to pay bills. This APR we're sitting on today wasn't allowed to have solar. And honestly, the small acreage that solar panels would have allowed this farm to, to have alternative energy. We couldn't have wind towers on our CR. I think that's unfortunate. In the future, I think the income and offset that would derive would make sure that family forest and farm stayed for a longer time. At a time when APR and farms are failing at alarming rates because farmers can't afford to pay the property taxes after their development rights have been sold, we need to start allowing more diverse income streams. The Massachusetts Office of Environmental Affairs and the Department of Conservation and Recreation support a wildlands and woodlands goal of protecting nearly half of Massachusetts forest land, which on the surface is a wonderful goal. We all want landscape level conservation. But what happens when some acres of the family forest should be producing food instead of trees? I'm not allowed to convert forest land to farmland under my CR, and I, I think that would be okay. What happens when the North Quabbin region wants to become more economically viable? Since most of east of Worcester is already developed, Western Mass will have to retain up to 90% forested for the state to reach that 50% goal. So what happens when Yankee Candle or Lane Construction or the Lathrop Retirement Community wants to expand? It's critical that we conserve farms and forests at a landscape level, but an overly aggressive forest only conservation goal that unreasonably hit certain rural towns is, is not the solution. We need a balance of goals for landscape level conservation and a reasonable amount of de development across the state. Now I just want to recognize the people who made this possible. Uh, Kristen DeBoer. Yeah. <laughs> We never did a CR, and Kristen came to my office, and she pointed at Brushy, and she said, I want that one. I said, it's enormous. I've never done this before. Let's start small. And she said, I want the big one. <laughs> so that's why we're here. And uh, Christy Edwards and Mary Griffin from Fish and Game have been awesome. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Elaine Peteroy and the Franklin Land Trust have been excellent partners. Thank you. <laughs> Shane Badgenosi, Cole's chief forester, and his predecessor, Gordon Boyce, who's here today, um, their exceptional sustainable forest management made Kristen want this mountain. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Shane Jeff Gillet, Kate Marquis, Cole's forestry team did all the groundwork for this CR, but there are so many people here today who helped us out. I can't begin to name you, and I, I so appreciate the time you took. Um, thank you, David Rainin and the chorus for making music today. If you need an event planner, Maureen Rabb is amazing. She put this on. My dad taught me that I could move mountains, but it was Fred Hayes who convinced me I could rename one. And I appreciate that the Fish and Wildlife Board accepted this project as the Paul C. Jones Working Forest. And finally, I'd like to thank my dad for inspiring this kind of greatness. Hey, before I give this mic back, I was reading through my notes so quickly, I skipped over the most important person. I called Sarah LaCour in a panic the instant I, I agreed to do this CR with Kristen, and she held my hand the whole time. I think she rewrote every word of a document this thick four times. And um, she is a partner now in Conservation Works, and she is helping other landowners achieve their conservation goals. So if you want the smartest girl on the planet, talk to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Cinda. Uh, I think you can tell from, uh, from all of the, the speeches so far that really this is a partnership um, that needed to come together to make this happen. And I can tell you that um, in the Patrick Murray administration, that is the way we will be doing land conservation and preservation uh, well uh, into the future because we need to be able to take our limited resources uh, at the state and federal level. Uh, we need to coordinate um, our monies, um, and I think we've done a pretty good job on this. I want to thank Ed Lambert uh, from DCR and, and Jack Murray um, and uh, Peter Church, and I know Mike Fleming, who runs the Legacy Program for us, and all the DCR employees, Mary Griffin, who's been introduced, but her and uh, Fi uh, Fish and Wildlife and its board, many uh, people that are here. First, we need to be coordinated, and when you look at the maps, it all makes sense because we put together contiguous pieces um, that do make sense from a preservation point of view. So I think we are stepping to the plate with a new model um, to be better partners, uh, but we certainly need the private um, landowners to step up, and we've got a great example of that today. Um, but we also have the land trusts that are the eyes and ears, and in many cases, in most cases, are the first on the ground building those relationships with our private landowners. And I'd like to call on two of our partners here to say a few words. One has already been introduced, so from the Kestrel Land Trust, its executive director, apparently the one who got the big one done, Kristen DeBoers. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see so many friends here. And it's such an incredible honor, a humbling honor, to follow the governor, the chief of the US Forest Service, Secretary Sullivan, and President Cinda Jones of Coles. Um, this moment in time and this place on the planet encompasses what the hopes and dreams of Kestrel Land Trust has for the Connecticut River Valley. It's the gathering of landowners, community members, board members, volunteers, philanthropists, public agencies. Those are the people that make conservation happen. And in this place that we see behind us, I want you all to look at the mountain for a second. And I also want you to look at the farm before you because uh, Gwen and Bill Mitchell offered to have this event here because they have the best view of the mountain in Leverett. Um, and we thank you for that. But this connection between farmland and woodlands, there are conservation lands um, that Rattlesnake Gutter Trust helped protect to our east, uh, North Amherst, Cushman Brook Conservation Area. It's that network of public and private conserved lands that sustain the rural integrity and ecological integrity of the valley. And that's what Kestrel's hopes and dreams are about. Um, last week, I attended uh, an event where the US Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, shined a, a, spotting, a, a national spotlight on the Connecticut River Valley and its watershed by designating it our, our country's first national blue way through the AmeriCorps Great Outdoors Initiative. And it's rare moments like that one last week and this one today 
where the local land trust and all the people who live here realize that uh, this place matters not only to us, but it matters to the human communities and the ecosystems that connect us across the country. This place has national significance as well as local significance. So for Kestrel Land Trust, um, we were founded in 1970 and, and we rely heavily on maps. And so this historic conservation project, like most of our work, started on a map. Um, the United, uh, University of Massachusetts has developed the conservation and analysis priority system, which looks at the forests of Massachusetts to identify the, the largest contiguous blocks. Brushy Mountain stands out as one of the areas of the highest ecological integrity, along with the likes of Mount Holyoke Range, Mount Toby, Mount Sugarloaf, and the Quabbin Reservoir, many of which are protected. So on this map, Kestrel saw an opportunity to protect more than 3,000 acres. But maps only take you so far. They can get you lost if you just stick to the map. Um, so it's the people who own the land that have the power to conserve them. Normally, an area of this size would be privately owned by dozens of landowners, and this area was owned by the single landowner, the Jones family. And these vast woods have persisted because of the care that family has put into their land. And it's not just here in Leverett, it's the hill towns of Pelham and Belchertown and Amherst. Um, and it's that network of forests that we all love so much that we really entrust to the Coles family. Um, and when the current generation and Cinda Jones took the helm, I, I feel like she brought a new level of vision and leadership to reach out to the conservation community, to collaborate to do voluntary conservation, which is what land trusts do. Uh, there's other ways to conserve land, but we do fair market value, voluntary conservation, and that worked for this family. And it works for a lot of landowners. And it was through Cinda's initiative and courage to take the step to preserve this land that this conservation restriction happened. Conservation of all private land can only happen with the leadership of, Cinda, uh, of landowners like Cinda and the Jones family who have the patience and foresight to commit to their farms and woodlands as they are now to keep them that way forever. This project would also not have happened without the exceptional group of partners that everyone has mentioned. Um, there's no way Kestrel could have done this alone, absolutely no way. The agencies and organizations that brought the expertise and clout and financial investment made the difference. Um, I want to point out a few people who haven't been mentioned yet. Uh, a lot of people worked behind the scenes, Bob O'Connor at EOEA, Mike Fleming at Forest Legacy, Mary Griffin, of course, but also Craig McDonnell, Sam, Sam Lovejoy, Christy Edwards, and Dane Crook, all of the Department of Fish and Game. Jennifer Melville and Peter Howell of the Open Space Institute, which provided a large portion of the private funds for this project and all the board and staff members at Kestrel Land Trust who had to hear about the process <laughs> and behind the scenes and give me the advice to get through it. Um, but most of all, it was the individuals who sat at the Coles round table for four years who made the difference. Cinda, of course, Sarah LaCour and Shane of, of Coles, Christy Edwards and Elaine Peteroy and Rich Hubbard of, of Franklin Land Trust. And together we had hundreds of meetings uh, which built the trust and the collaborative spirit and the camaraderie that we needed to succeed. And during that four years, we developed friendships. Um, and several of us, four of us, in fact, lost a parent during that time period. Um, I lost my mom, Cinda lost her father, and it was in these moments of grief that sometimes work becomes less meaningful. We, we focus on our family, work, work seems meaningless sometimes. But this work, this conservation work, became more meaningful because it caused us all to focus on the meaning of legacy. So because of, of death and life, we all had the cause to ask ourselves, what are we going to leave for our children and our communities? And all of us can ask, ask that of ourselves. Kestrel Land Trust is committed to working with landowners who want to leave a legacy in their farms and woodlands. And the conservation of the forest, uh, Paul C. Jones working forest, has been the biggest project that Kestrel and our partners have ever completed but we're committed to doing more. We, um, Kestrel, Kestrel, have pledged to conserve at least 1,000 acres each and every year for the next 10 years by collaborating with our partners. Because of this work, we know that this 3,486 acres will be protected forever, remain a forest forever, farmland forever, forest forever. This is Paul's legacy, your legacy, and I'm proud to have shared in it. 
Um, finally, in closing, uh, many of you, the governor spoke, uh, the U.S. Forest Service chief spoke of the economic benefits of, of conservation, and those are very important, the habitat benefits to biodiversity, the acres, the animals. But in closing, I'd like to speak about the intangible benefits, our quality of life, the solitude, the emotional and spiritual connection to the land that I think we can all tap into at one point or another. So I'm going to leave you with a poem. It's it's called My Help is in the Mountain. I actually read this poem uh, on one of the final days of our negotiation to give me the strength to make it all happen. So I'll read that to you now. My help is in the mountain where I take myself to heal. I find a rock with sun on it and a stream where the water runs clear. So I must stay for a long time until I have grown from the rock and the stream is running through me. And I cannot tell myself from one tall tree. Then I know that nothing touches me, nor makes me run away. My help is in the mountain, that I take away with me. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Now I think we all can see how you got the big one done. Um, I did want to um, thank and recognize the uh, Board of Selectmen and the other um, town officials from Leverett um, that have been instrumental in making this happen. I was in Leverett recently uh, as they became a green community um, and celebration and I have to say that they took great pride um, in this project and the work that they've done um, adding to it so thank you to all of the uh, town officials as well um, Rich Hubbard is our next speaker from the Franklin Land Trust and I've known Rich for uh, a number of years um, and I've worked with him on uh, the big ones but also on the small ones um, but they are all thoughtful they are all important uh, and they all um, make a bigger picture of land conservation uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, particularly um, in Western Massachusetts. So I'd like to call on Rich Hubbard uh, for a few words from Franklin Land Trust. Nothing like being the last speaker standing before a, between a crowd and lunch in a very hot tent. But being the last speaker, I don't know how much more really can be said than what has already been said. And I could just really almost just say ditto to Kristen's really wonderful um, presentation, but I did want to start off by thanking uh, my director of land conservation, Elaine Peteroy, who, after I was involved in this project early on, we did a little tag, tag team with her, and she became one of the gang of five, I think it's the gang of five, or six, five or six, that took this to the finish, and I really appreciate all that she does for our land trust, and I also really wanted to emphasize how much I value the partnerships that were involved uh, in this project, Kristen. Um, Kestrel Land Trust, uh, Open Space Institute, the state and federal partners, everyone who contributed to this project, as Kristen said, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened without, without all that work. And, and while partnerships can make things sometimes really uh, interesting, difficult at times, they also make these types of projects extremely gratifying. Um, I've been doing this work for a long, long time, many more years than I want to count. And I think I've worked something, with something like 500 landowners over the years in helping them to conserve their land. And, um, there's no, both as APR program manager for uh, many years and uh, with the Franklin Land Trust, and there's no question in my mind that I'm going to step back at some point and look back on this project as being one of the, the, the pinnacles of, of, of my work um, and of all of our work. And uh, it's for two reasons. One, it's obviously the large, it's just the size of this beautiful mountain and its environmental significance. I would argue it almost has global significance when you look at, it, look at it in the context of all the other conserved land, to, especially to the east of here with the Quabbin Reservoir and Harvest Forest, Harvard Forest Holdings. I mean, it's really quite remarkable. But I think the other reason I'm going to think of this project in my, the days ahead a lot is the, the bigger than life personality of Cinda. And, um, <laughs> trying to figure out a way to um, describe her. She sort of an has a combination of unabashed libertarianism with a pugnacious conservationist. <laughs> and you can see that this morning in her comments. <laughs> but I will tell you, there's nobody has a greater passion and love for their land than, than Cinda. And um, I think um, you all know that now. No one could ever question that again. I, and you and your family have left <clears throat> an amazing legacy for us and for our generations to come. Really, thank you. Um, also, uh, I, I wanted to switch gears just briefly here as uh, I, I wear the hat of the chairman of the Mass Land Trust Coalition uh, Steering Committee. And um, so I'd like to switch gears a little bit here and uh, say a few things with that hat on. Uh, this state has a long, proud history of public investment in land conservation. Uh, and that's really what we're celebrating here today, quite frankly. It's, it's, it's the public's investment in protecting this beautiful resource, Brushy Mountain just being the latest dividend in that effort. 
Uh, but those of us who are in the business are ke keenly aware of the fact that our success over the years has depended heavily on that investment and that the support of our friends in the legislature and Congress has been critical to funding, that funding continuing to flow. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the environment is considered a luxury item during tough economic times, and it's the first thing to take a hit. But we are blessed out here in Western Massachusetts with having the most incredible legislative and uh, congressional delegation uh, that clearly gets it. We, we, we don't, can, can get a little frustrating sometimes. We don't have anything to yell at down in Washington <laughs> when things aren't going right. Our, our guys all get it. But um, I want to thank you all for all that you do to make our work possible. Uh, Congressman Olver. Through your efforts over the many years in support of land conservation, both in the Mass Legislature and Congress, you have left an indelible mark on the rural landscapes of Massachusetts. Uh, it's hard to prove a negative, but those of us who are out on the land doing this work know how different this valley and this state would look today if it weren't for your passion and your commitment to our to, and hard work and in and, and, uh, support of our work. We'll miss having your voice in Washington, and we'll be forever grateful to you. And finally, Governor Patrick, uh, when you came into office, you came with an amazing pledge to fund land conservation at historic levels. And you stood at, by that pledge through historically difficult financial times. I wish I could take you on an extended field trip around this state and just show you every property, farm, forest, scenic viewshed, park that has been conserved thanks to your commitment and your vision. I think only then could you really fully appreciate uh, the incredible impact that your pledge has had on this beautiful state. Over the years, the land conservation movement in Massachusetts has been through good times and bad times as administrations have come and, come and gone. Uh, since we're in the throes of what is likely to be a very heated uh, presidential campaign, I'm not going to mention when the last low time was <laughs> for our movement. However, there's no question that you and your administra administration represents a high water mark. Um, on behalf of the Mass Land Trust Coalition and land trusts across Massachusetts, thank you. In closing, I do want to recognize uh, Bob O'Connor and uh, Assistant Secretary uh, for the Environment, Stephanie Cooper, from my office uh, that have been uh, done a great job here. Thank you both for that. Uh, and as we bring the formal dedications of the Paul C. Jones Working Force to conclusion and the celebration of the legacy of the Jones family, uh, I think it is most appropriate to once again say thank you and to turn it over uh, once again, to end the way we started, which was with the Amherst Regional Middle School Choir and Dave Rand. Thank you all very, very much. It's wonderful to, to be here. Um, thank you to, to the Jones family. Cinda and I go way back. I met Cinda when I started teaching in Amherst, which has been for 32 years. Yeah. Cinda walked into my class my very first year as a seventh grader. Oh. And, uh, so that's how we met. Oh. And um, Cinda was very vocal back then. <laughs> and, uh, and what I mean by that is that she was a very strong singer. And, uh, <laughs> very strong voice in, in my group and helping out a very young teacher um, learn um, how to become a, um, a very seasoned teacher as I like to think that I am now. So Cinda, thank you very much. It's been, uh, it, was, it was wonderful to hear from you and thank you for calling and saying, please come and sing. Um, in your cups, you have a sheet and we want you to join with us as we invite a very special guest who we understand is here with us today. And we have a song to greet our very special guest. So please join with us. 